Hi, uh, I'm Chen Jin. I'm a fourth year PhD student working in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry here at UCLA. And uh, I'm working with Professor Paul West, who is a nanoscientist here, mm -hmm. and Professor Anne Andrews, who is a neuroscientist. So I mainly focus on the basically two parts. One mm -hmm. part is the development of those um, advanced nanofabrication and nanolithography tools. Mm -hmm. So we aim for large area, high throughput, low cost mm -hmm. nanolithography techno technologies okay. that could down to five nanometers. Okay. So it's a pretty fancy uh, nanolithography tools. What we do is we want we don't want the the whole high cost stuff. Right. So basically, I I tried those conventional stuff before as well. Uh -huh. So for example, we have uh, e-beam lithography here in the clinic at UCLA. Okay. Not it's great we have that, but not mm -hmm. every university has that facility because right. it's, it's it's very expensive. Right. And uh, let's say if I want to patent something in 0.5 centimeter by 0.5 centimeters. Okay. And I just want uh, some 500 nanometer features. Mm -hmm. So those whole thing, when I get into the clean room, you know, do the, all the design before going that, and the writing time for the e-beam lithography is over two hours. Uh, and just to write those dots, mm -hmm. to expose them dot by dot. Okay. And uh, those whole process cost me over 300 bucks, just a 0.5 centimeter by 0.5 centimeters wow. area. So it's slow, it's low throughput, uh -huh. and it is very expensive. Right. So what our labs want to do is uh, to develop some nanolithography tools mm -hmm. that is, uh, could achieve those features, but mm -hmm. we don't have to go to clean room or even use those super expensive tools. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing we are working on, or the whole field moving forward is called soft lithography. Okay. So what we do, basically we use a, a rubber stamp. So most of them are made from uh, polydimethylsiloxane, which is a polymer. Okay. And uh, you have the features on the silicon chip, which is made by the way that I just uh, actually I just described that to you. Uh -huh. So if you want circles, you do the whole process, and right. you got the silicon chip. And then you pour the, the polymer onto the surface, basically mm -hmm. to replicate the features you have on the silicon chip. Mm -hmm. And then you peel them off. You have the rubber stamp that uh, has the features you want on, on the stamp which is soft. And you can do this a lot of times, get a lot of, as many as, as you want, because mm -hmm. it basically costs uh, $10 mm -hmm. for a lot of them. And uh, wow. you can use this to patent stuff. So the way we do is uh, we develop the technology called chemical lift lithography, okay. in, in short CLL. Mm -hmm. So what the CLL do is that uh, you get, a, let's say, a gold chip. Basically a silicon chip, you evaporate some gold on the top. Mm -hmm. And then you put a, a layer of a self-assembled monolayer, arcanthyl, on the surface. So they will form a very nice close-packed uh, molecular monolayer on, on the surface. Okay. And then they, you, you, you use this uh, rubber stamp, I just told you that. And you put those two into contact. Okay. And uh, they will form a covalent bond between the PDMA stem and uh, the, the arcanthyl molecules. Okay. And those, those covalent bond is so strong, that is stronger than the gold-gold bond. It will lift off the molecule in the contact area. And uh, as, well, as, well, mm. as well as several layers of several gold atoms. Mm -hmm. So after this, you basically have a substrate mm -hmm. that uh, most of them are covered by the molecule. Mm -hmm. Some of them are not. And uh, those areas is considered as exposed areas. Right. And, uh, Similar principle as a conventional photolithography. You use those molecules as a resist. Then you can etch the, the gold. So you can have the gold patterning using this way. And we have achieved down to five nanometers resolution using this technology. And this whole process is uh, kingdom free and it could be large area and uh, it's quite cheap. Wow. Yeah. And we are now exploring that from the gold surface to the semiconductor, for example, the, the indium oxide, uh, metal oxide semiconductor surface to pattern more and more materials using this technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. We're very and excited about that. Yeah, no mm -hmm. kidding. And how does, what WPI um, product are you using again? How does WPI come into this? Yeah, so basically, with such a strong tool in hand, we want to explore how we gonna apply those uh, patterning or lithography or fabrication tools we have to the 
applications, mm -hmm. a variety of, uh, I see, biomedical applications. And people always asking, you can patent this, you know, you know, five nanometers, but those are chemical molecules, you can patent this gold, semiconductor, but why we need them, mm -hmm. right? That's always mm -hmm. the question we got. And so one thing that uh, we are really interested in is to fabricate those uh, uh, biosensors. That's okay. where the WPI come in actually for to, to our labs. Uh -huh. So the way we do is, uh, the platform we are developing now is we using a semiconductor called indium oxide. Okay. And the way you prepare them is you got a silicon wafer and you just uh, sprinkle some uh, indium nitrate precursor solution on the surface. So basically you drop them and a spin and you, after that you put them onto, on, on the hot plate to do a, a annealing process. Mm. And using this process, is quite uh, scalable and uh, simple and we can do four nanometers thin film on the surface mm. so think about it four nanometer is basically several atoms thickness right so right. and uh, those ultra thin layers is critical to our sensing applications because it has a higher surface volume ratio that means that you have a lot of surface exposed to the environment that could be used to detect molecule or sensing the molecules so that's the ideal case for the mm, for the sensing. I see. And that's why a lot of people are using, let's say, carbon nanotubes or the graphene, because those stuff are very thin and uh, they have large surface area compared with the air volume. Right. And uh, the way we construct them is we have those layer, and then we put a salt string electrode on the on the indium oxide. Uh -huh. So that could be patented by the CIL process, which is clean, totally clean room free. Mm -hmm. And after this source stream process, we, we functionalize the surface of those uh, semiconductor mm -hmm. with a, a thing called aptamer, which is short DNA or RNA molecules that are designed to bind specific molecules. Let's see if you have serotonin aptamers that could bind to the serotonin specifically. Mm -hmm. And we put those guys on the surface. And after you have this chip, you put them on the desk and you put the whole thing onto a buffer solution buffer mm -hmm. environment. That's you have phosphate buffer ceiling, the PBS solution. And then we need the, the product from w, WPI actually. So the silver cell chloride going to be put on the top in mm -hmm. contact with the solution. We use that as a gate electrode. So the uh, principle okay. of how those uh, uh, transistor work is you apply the voltage between the source string electrode mm -hmm. and you apply another voltage between the gate electrode and the source electrode. And so there will be a current of flow between those uh, source and drain, and basically they flow through the semiconductor surface. Mm -hmm. and, and if you have some uh, analyze that binding to the surface, that will induce some charges on the surface that could be detected by the host devices. Mm -hmm. Let's say if you have aptamer here, and you have a molecule from outside environment that will be captured by the aptamer, the aptamer will, uh, will go a uh, conformal change because the whole aptamer is a DNA backbone that is a negative charge and you will induce a negative charge to the surface that could be detected by our transistor. Mm. But the problem here is that we need to apply a very small current or the voltage to the whole system and we need them to be very stable. Mm. Let's see the whole gate electrode and the source electrode, we have a 300 millivolts of voltage drop between them. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, we don't want the electrode to be leaking because um, the system we are detecting with, uh, with this whole sensor setup is can go down to femtomolar range. That is uh, around 10 to the negative 15 molar per liter. So it's pretty, pretty low. Uh -huh. And if you have something leakage from the, the electrode, we cannot really detect anything. Right. But the product from WPI is awesome for our purpose. Mm -hmm. So we can use this tiny electrode. Mm -hmm. We because we have a setup with the PDMS wells mm -hmm. that is uh, covering everything on the on the sensor and also the the buffer solution. And you put the WPI made uh, silver cell chloride on the top. Mm -hmm. And using this method, we can uh, achieve femtomolar detection of um, some neurotransmitters extra vivo or the in vitro, such as uh, serotonin, dopamine, and other stuff such as glucose. Right. So it's pretty awesome. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. We appreciate your product. Yeah. So the, the motivation for us to develop those uh, neurochemical sensors mm -hmm. is that uh, we want to monitor the neurotransmitters in the brain. 
Right. So that is, uh, uh, so understanding how the brain functions is one of the big challenges nowadays and yes. facing by the whole neuroscience community. And those understanding will help us to develop some treatment for the neurological diseases, such as Parkinson's diseases mm -hmm. and uh, Alzheimer's diseases. Mm -hmm. So many of those stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's uh, a lot of tools available to uh, being developed for the electrophysiology uh, detection, mm -hmm. such as the claim patch you guys have. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people are developing the, those neural probes mm -hmm. that can detect the electrical signal that passing around your neurons. Sure. But they are limited to all that uh, on, the, on the table that people can be used to detect those neurotransmitters that is, uh, have a lot of information passing between those neurons. Mm -hmm. And it will release neurotransmitters from one neuron to the other one, and it will trigger the electrical signal passing through the whole neurons. Right. But uh, the problem with that is uh, we don't ha really have uh, such a good sensor that it can detect those neurotransmitters in a highly selective and highly sensitive way. Mm -hmm. So the, th the platform we develop right now in the lab that can achieve those such a low detection limit that can fit in the physiological range of the neurotransmitter release in the brain. Mm. And we think with this tool, we are moving aggressively towards uh, in vivo experiment, developing some neural probes as well to see if we can develop or build up the tool that can be used to monitor neurotransmitters in the brain. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we will provide us a big picture of how the brain functions and how those neurochemicals uh, interact with each other in the brain with the electrical signals as well. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the, the Professor Andrews ultimate goal in the lab. So because I work with both lab and Paul is a nanoscience, right. Right. Nanoscientists, you know, we have those uh, great tools in the lab, and I is more interested in the, the, the neurotransmitters, in specific serotonin. So we can, it, it's a privilege working in both labs because yeah. you can apply the nanotechnology or nanofabrication stuff to the neuroscience field, and at the same time, you can get feedback from the neuroscience that do we like it or not, or what need right. to be improved. And we go back, so we keep doing this and uh, until we find a uh, a better tool that can be used in this field. Right, yeah. right. That, that's kind of uh, our whole motivation for this biosensor development. Yeah. But uh, for me, I am not sure yet, <laughs> but I'm now more, more into the field of the biomedical stuff. So okay. let's see the sensor development. And we want to see, uh, I want to see how those uh, uh, nanoscale sensors could be used for in vivo uh, purposes also uh -huh. and the point of care devices and the wearable devices. Want to see how to build up the knowledge between the nanotechnology and the biomedical field to maybe some implantable devices and uh, portable wearable devices. Mm. That's kind of the direction mm. I'm, um, I'm looking for. And mm. I think it's quite exciting as we have huge biomedical market. Yeah. yeah. For sure. Mm -hmm.